Danger man cooking. Hello and welcome to Danger Men Cooking. My name is Gary Schmidt. And I'm Steven Schlissel. Today on Danger Men Cooking, we're taking you to Florence. Not to Italy to see the Botticellis, but to Florence, Vermont, to see Vermont hydroponic tomato. Going to Gringo Jack's here in Manchester to see what they're doing with those tomatoes, visiting Earth Sea Fish Market here in Manchester, and then out to my potato field to harvest some wild amaranth to cook with our meal today. So, Sounds good. Without further ado, Olé. welcome to our show. Hey, Chris. Hey, good. Gary. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Gary Schmidt with Danger Men Cooking, and we're here at Vermont Hydroponic. And this is Chris, the greenhouse manager, grower, right? right? Yep. So, uh, as you can see, we're in the middle of thousands of tomato plants. So, uh, Chris, give us an idea how many you actually have. In here right now, I have roughly 2,000 plants. And I started with about 1,600, and I made additional plants. Uh -huh. And uh, what do you uh, yield on something like this? A yearly production out of this facility with the amount of, that I'm growing now will be about 60 to 70,000 pounds for the year. These plants, uh, obviously, they need some sort of structural support. Correct. So how, 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 well, how do you do that? As the plants grow taller, uh, they are guided by the twine here, and with that, as they get to a certain height, these guys actually do, uh, but we'll add this clip here to hold the plant up and to train it to continue to grow vertically. Uh -huh. So you support it right from the start? Yeah, right from the very right beginning. From the start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And every week we put a clip on. Uh -huh. And so a plant this size, uh, when did you start this and how long did it take to get to this? Size. These plants were started from seed in the beginning of February. They stayed in my nursery for about a month and they came out here the first week of March and here we are the second week in June and they're at this stage. And so uh, I don't know if the viewers can see down below we have obviously the growing pot or what do you call it? Growing that? media. Media, yep. okay. And then so what exactly is it that the plants need to get to this particular state? All, all plants require about 13 elements. Uh, I'm providing all of them because I do not grow in soil. Cocoa fiber is inert. Uh -huh. So I'm adding their calcium, their potassium, their nitrate, their iron, their magnesium, and all those are kind of the macronutrients, all the heavy hitter ones. Right. They also provide their micronutrients, things like zinc, copper, molybdenum. Uh -huh. uh, also, I'm able to mix that, and that's all dependent on my well water. I have two varieties in here, one being the Claremont and the other being the Macarena. And the Claremont are my cluster tomatoes, which are five to a vine. Uh -huh. And the Macarena are, are our big beefsteak, which is our signature tomato. Uh, so the cluster tomatoes are the ones that you uh, see at the grocery store that come in groups of five yeah, or six? Yeah, generally five tomatoes uh -huh. on a vine. Oh, yeah. And how do you do that? I mean, how, how come they're always just five? We prune, right as a tomato is a very small stage, about the size of a pea and we'll prune them back to uh, get the five count on uh -huh. the tomatoes. So once the tomatoes are harvested, who do you distribute to? Our main customers are wholesale customers, which are our supermarket chains, Price Shopper being our biggest one. Uh -huh. We are also in Hannaford, a few shaws in the state of Vermont. We also do our local Rutland Farmer's Market. That's where people can pick them up close right. to home. Okay. And we are in a number of restaurants and co-ops in the state as well. Uh, so what would you say are the advantages to growing tomatoes like this? There's a number of advantages. One being you're in a controlled environment, so you don't have to deal with uh, a lot of pests and birds and wildlife. Also, you have to keep the rain off from your crop. 
Uh, another one being that you can have much tighter spacing in here because of the environmental control. So you're able to grow a lot more plants or right. produce in a confined area. Right. Another one being is that you have a lot more consistency with the end result, me being the tomatoes, they come out far more consistent than what's out in the field. Right. Just be, again, because of the control. Yeah. Uh, another big, big plus is my water usage is about 70% less than what traditional farming is currently using now out in the field. Right. And that's a big deal. Sure. Because uh, water demand is, is gonna be a, a big hot topic yeah. in the years to come. Even here in Vermont? Even here, it's coming, it's here now. Oh really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Really? I mean, fresh water is uh, it's a vital resource that is right. constantly being depleted. Right. So uh, it's so important it's to watch our water use. Much more economical way to grow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would say so. It's, yeah. uh, it, it, it is now and it will continue right. to be. So uh, now when you harvest these, what's that involved with that operation? It's me and one other person that's able to harvest all the produce in this oh, greenhouse. Really? Uh, we wear gloves and we come through and literally pick each tomato off by hand and then they'll get packed and sorted by hand. Uh -huh. uh, then they're about boxed up and uh, shipped out. And so as I observed this nursery, uh, it's extremely clean. So how do you maintain something like this? It's just constant cleaning. Just yeah, uh -huh. we remove leaves off the bottom of the plant, uh -huh. and we pick them up that day or the next day, uh, and just keep the place swept out. Right. Anything that falls on the ground, we're constantly keeping up right. on. Right. And do you get inspections by? Yeah, we are GAP certified. State. So we do have an audit a few times a year, mm -hmm. and he checks up on our process and making sure that we're conforming right. to the rules that we set for it. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's about it, because uh, Chris, thank you. I think we're going to go jump in the pool somewhere. Welcome back. And now we're going to make some bruschetta with the tomatoes that we've just seen. And uh, as you can see, these are some beautiful looking tomatoes. So the first thing we're going to do is get the core out of the tomato. And bruschetta is one of those dishes that has many purposes, can be used for many things. We're going to use it as an appetizer today. So we're slicing the tomato in small sections, we're going to dice it, and when you're making something similar in nature to this dish, it's best to make sure that all of the dices are similar in size. We have the tomato that we're cutting, we have garlic that's very small, and then we have some nice diced onions, and we also have some capers. Of course, we're not cutting those, but they are uniform in size, and so we want to keep the tomato, the onion, and the garlic all in some uniform size. And of course, as you saw, we kept the skin on the tomato, no problem. We'll put the tomatoes into the bowl. We have some freshly diced garlic. The amount of garlic that you use is strictly a personal thing. The more you use, the stronger it is, of course. We have some nice capers, and I'm going to throw in some of the juice. Diced onion. And I have some salt. We're going to sprinkle just enough to cover the entire surface. And we have some fresh basil. That's going to be, I like basil, so we're going to add a fair amount of that. And now, we're going to stir that up, and last but not least, we have some olive oil. And in my opinion, you can't use too much olive oil. It's very 
flavorful. Now, what we're going to do is place the bruschetta on a uh, toasted crouton. I've made some croutons ahead of time, and this is simply just a piece of toast seasoned with a little salt and olive oil, sautéed in a frying pan until it's nice and crisp. And I've added some goat's cheese. We're going to add the bruschetta to the crouton with the goat's cheese. You have the crispness of the toast, the softness of the cheese, and the freshness of the vegetables that create the bruschetta. And for the final touch, I brought with me a little cream made out of curry and uh, yogurt, Greek-style yogurt. So for a little color, we're going to place a little dab right on top of the bruschetta. And I think that looks pretty good. Bon appetit. OK, welcome back again. So we're going to make a side dish of bulgar wheat. Uh, later in the show, we're going to make a nice seafood stew. And uh, to accompany the seafood stew, we're going to have bulgar wheat. And uh, a lot of people are not familiar with bulgar wheat, so this is a good opportunity to learn. Uh, bulgar wheat is essentially cooked similar in nature to rice. So we're going to start out with some olive oil in the pan. And we're going to saute some onions, garlic, diced garlic, mushrooms, diced mushrooms, and when you're cooking, with mushrooms. Most times the mushrooms will be soaking up the oil that you're dealing with. So if you see that the pan dries up a little bit, don't hesitate to add a little bit more oil. And once you see that uh, the onions become transparent, we're going to then add the bulgar wheat. And I'm going to add uh, exactly a cup. And we're stirring that to roast the bulgar wheat, just as if you do rice when you're making a pilaf. And you can see that that is looking nice and moist with the oil. You want to keep enough oil content in there so that when we have the finished product, it doesn't stick together like rice. Now I have here boiling some water. And we're going to go with two to one. So it's two cups of water to one cup of bulgar wheat, just exactly the same as rice. And we throw the water in the bulgar. And as with rice, we let it come to a boil, which is immediate as, at this moment, of course, since this was boiling already. And once we come to a boil, we'll turn the flame down to a simmer and put a top on it and let it cook at a low temperature. And bulgar wheat cooks a lot faster than rice. So as opposed to uh, cooking rice, which takes about 40 minutes, 30 minutes to 40 minutes, bulgar wheat will take about 15 to 20 minutes on a slow simmer. OK, we're back to make the seafood stew. And so in order to do that, we're going to go visit Gringo Jack's in Manchester, where they produce this fresh tomato and basil pasta sauce. And uh, they utilize the hydroponic tomatoes that we just made the bruschetta out of. So let's go see how they create their pasta sauce. All right. We are here at Gringo Jack's in Manchester, 
and uh, with me is one of the owners, Jack Gilbert, and we're here to discuss with him uh, his products that he's making out of the restaurant, uh, pasta sauces and salsas. And uh, Jack, why don't you uh, give us an idea of what's happening here? Well, Gary, the first thing I'd like to do is alleviate some of the confusion out there. Candeleros changed their name to Gringo Jack's predominantly because of our product line. We're having such great success with it uh -huh. out, out right. in the world at large where some of the things, the salsas and chips are in Shaw's, uh, Hannaford's, Whole Foods. Oh, great. And we're now Good. sort of moving down south a little bit too. South of the border. Well, say south of the Vermont border. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, today we have a soup and a salsa on. Um, we, we partnered up with uh, Vermont Hydroponic Tomatoes, uh, which grows tomatoes 30 miles north of here uh -huh. in a uh, controlled environment in a greenhouse, uh -huh. pesticide-free, uh, with nutrient-rich enrichments added, and then uh, a great flavorful tomato. Right. And we've been, uh, we started up with them with our Vermont local, local salsa. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been doing very well this, this summer for the first summer. And then they came to us and said, well, you know, we're going to shut down the greenhouse. Uh, do you want any more tomatoes? And we said, sure, we'll take the whole, the, the whole greenhouse. Right. And so and you know, we ended up with about 3,500 pounds of tomatoes. So we went up and picked them, and they're reds, pinks, and greens, and we're ripening up some. We're going to be doing a, uh, a private label for another company called uh, Pottsfield Relish. We're going to be doing a green and red tomato. Uh -huh. Uh, with them for them and you know in addition to that we were doing three soups we got a Mexican wedding soup uh, uh -huh. kind of like a tortilla soup right a tomato ginger and a carrot coconut with jalapenos oh, and uh, cilantro and then we came up with three pasta sauces and there's plenty of pasta sauce out there so we came up with this really unique Spanish uh, Spanish-influenced mm -hmm. uh, pasta sauce called Romesco, which has roasted garlic, a little bit of chilies in it, so it has right. a little bit of nice heat to it. A little bite to it. A little bite to Good. it. And of course, we did a fried Diablo, a nice little spicy uh -huh. tomato one. And so do you incorporate these into your menu here as well? Um, we've, we've been using the soups. Uh, we haven't really ch gotten into uh -huh. trying to do a pasta dish here at the restaurant right. yet. I'm not sh sure whether that's going to actually right. work or not. Right. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks of us as being Mexican right. and barbecue. Right, right. And here we have the this is, uh, soup. This soup right there is a Mexican wedding soup. Mm -hmm. So it has uh, dried lima beans in it, mm, roasted that tomatoes. Good. I can smell that garlic. Yeah, that's lots great. of garlic. Yeah, I'm that's really good. I'm always amazed how much garlic we use here. <laughs> that's good for you. And we have a salsa uh -huh. also. And what's over here? It's called Caliente. The other, that's Caliente. Uh -huh. We actually just won a Scobie Award for this salsa, Caliente, uh, down at the Fiery Foods Challenge. Oh, where is that? That's uh, it's down in the award ceremony is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. so, so you we, were up there against some tough competition there. We were, we were. We actually won uh, two. We won for Caliente, and we won for our spiced uh, flour tortilla. Oh, chip. oh, great! With a little chili rub on top. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. And so what's the uh, cooking process here? How long would you say the salsa takes to uh, The salsa cook? takes a couple hours to bring up. Mm -hmm. To bring up, there's you know, about an hour, an hour and a half of prep time. Right. On the uh, tomato products, we tend to bring them in, and then uh, we will process them and cook them down a little bit right. uh, ahead of time uh, so that we're basically making like our own puree. Right. So you can cook one batch easily in a day and then have it ready to go into the... Yeah, we'll do, ten, we'll do 10 of these pots today. 10 today? Ten. Oh, wow. We'll do 10 pots right. today. There's, uh, there's actually three people working on it. Two, two guys prepping, one person bottling mm -hmm. and labeling. Uh, oh, really? Uh, and the onions you have here are grilling? You know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways that we get a unique flavor profile is that we like to grill things and fire roast them. Uh-huh. Um, so we'll fire roast onions, uh, jalapenos, um, and some of the other peppers we use, poblanos. Right. Poblanos. That's uh, one of the ways that we add a different level of flavor into it. And we actually look for a little bit of char. Yeah. We don't want right. too much char, but we want just enough to add, to bring that sweetness out mm -hmm. of the onions. We also roast our own garlic here. Do, do, huh? Good. 
good. Yeah, yeah any. Most of the garlic's wonderful as opposed to the, you know, the sharp bitterness of the oh, garlic. Right, oh, right, right. Yeah, and anything roasted whole like that certainly brings out that flavor uh, much more so. And so after this, after it's roasted, then you process it in a blender or you... Depending on whether, this, in the soup it's uh, julienne, uh -huh. in the salsas they're diced, uh -huh. um, in the pasta sauces they might be puree. Right, okay. Very good. And you know, what makes us different also is, is that, you know, each pot, we make each pot. It's not like in a lot of the big processes there'll be a, a, a pot that's 150 gallons or larger. Right. So right. they really kind of dump and fill. Right, right. And then bring up the temperature. We bring right. in actual real products, start with real products, and... You start, it. you start fresh with every pot. Brand start, new. Start from scratch and bring, bring it right. up. Right, yeah, great, very nice. This smells really good. Oh, that's great. And it's got a nice kick to it. And you know, it's gonna take a while to, yeah. just like every good sauce, it takes a while to marry up all the right. flavors. Yeah. yeah. And that's that, uh, the chilies will either bloom a little bit more or blend in a right. little bit more, depending on what the, what we're using. That's hot. <laughs> uh, now tell us about okay. how you uh, distribute the products. Uh, well, we use a locally we use Vermont Roots, which is uh -huh. a, a distributor that predominantly for local products. Uh -huh. We also have uh, distributors. Uh, in New Hampshire, um, Pennsylvania, and Florida, and we're just and actually we're just breaking into the New York region. Great, New York City. And of course, you sell these here at the yep. restaurant. Yep, everything's here, and we have a line of a lo an extensive line of salsas with using conventional tomatoes. Right. Uh, Mexican cooking sauces, three different chips, besides the pasta and soups. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Ready to eat. Great. Thank you so much. Good luck on cooking. All right. Okay, now we're going to visit Earth and Sea in Manchester on Richville Road. And uh, you'll see where we obtained this beautiful seafood. We've got some shrimp, scallops, mussels, fresh red snapper, and some haddock. So, go and take a look. Okay, here we are at Earth and Sea Seafood Market in Manchester on Ridgeville Road. And with me is the happy crew. <laughs> and uh, I have here Rachel, and uh, she's the office manager. And before we get started, Rachel, why don't you introduce the gang to us? All right. Um, this is Carrie. She is our, one of our chief retail people. This is Bob. He is the owner of Earth and Sea Fish Market. And this is Joe, who is head of the retail department. Okay, great. So it's the four of you plus a uh, set of drivers out there That's who deliver correct. and yeah. uh, pick up the fish and so forth. Right. Well, uh, as you can see in the store, there's a plethora of interesting things, specialty foods, and but most of all, we have lots of fresh fish. So uh, why don't you tell us about how it gets here and uh, so forth. All right, uh, we have truck that goes to Boston four days a week. We go down to the docks and get the fish off of the boats. And we buy primarily whole fish. Uh, the fish is brought back here to the plant and it is cut up the stairs, which you will see a little later. So this comes right off the boats? Right off the right boats. Right off, fresh, fresh as a daisy. Yes, and, and it I think one of um, the chief things about our fish is that we do buy whole fish and we do cut it ourselves, and that makes a great deal of difference in the quality that you get. It's not something you usually get out of a supermarket. All right, so you can uh, take special orders and so forth? Yes, um, yes. If anybody has a special order, if they want a whole fish, um, we're happy to do anything that you need done. Um, just so you know, we do a great wholesale business here. That is the majority, probably 90% of our business is wholesale. Uh, we do go all over. We go to New York State, Saratoga, Albany. We go to New Hampshire. We have two very good accounts over there, the co-ops, Lebanon and um, Hanover Food, Sea Food Co-ops. We also go in Manchester, Dorset, all of Vermont, primarily. Uh, Queegee, Woodstock, and we sell primarily to restaurants 
but also to some stores like the Woodstock Farmers Market, as I said, Hanover Food Co-op, Lebanon Food Co-op. And uh, so what do you estimate per week, uh, pound-wise, that you bring in, would you say? Of course, that's going to vary with the time of year. I mean, uh -huh. we're definitely busier in the summertime during holiday periods. Right. But on an average, Bob, what would you say? Well, in the thousands, maybe close to 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds a week. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good fish. Yes, that's right. And Joe, you're the uh, retail manager? Yes. Our retail case is here. It's all refrigerated ice down. The fish is all fresh. Most of it is all bone free. Probably most of it is bone free. We cut to order. Mm -hmm. We cook to order sometimes if you have to order. We make fish platters to go. We make all kinds of prepared foods. We make soups, salads, fish cakes. We have frozen fish to go. We have all kinds of macaroni products. We have all kinds of shelled fish. So you have a kitchen facility here, obviously. Yeah. Kitchen, yes. So let's let's take a look over here at the uh, specialty food case here. Yeah. Well, right now we're in the process of making fish cakes, which we make salmon cakes. And I have the fish salad. cakes, okay. You know, we have all kinds of smoked fish. We have canned fish. We make all kinds of dips. We make two lobster dips. We make a smoked salmon dip. We sell olives and brine. We have salad dressings. Cocktail sauce, tartar sauce. You see, you uh, make your own fish stock. We make our own fish stock and all the crab time. cakes and yes. all sorts of things. So, uh, not only can they come in here for just fish, but some real specialty items that you really don't get anywhere else. Walk out and have your whole supper with you. Right, <laughs> right. And chowders and soups. We make soups all the time. Holiday time, we make specialty soups. We make lobster bisque, shrimp bisque. Uh -huh. oh, we have we've got a clam chowder on hand. We make gazpacho in the summer with shrimps. And speaking of lobsters, we and have... Beautiful lobster taint. They're always alive and fresh. And we cook. Oh, beautiful. And people always ask you if they would like a male or a female. Uh-huh. And of course, you know how to tell that. Go ahead and explain that to everybody. The female always has an open, open tail, because that's where the eggs sit, uh -huh. when she has eggs. And these are softer on the female than the male. We cook lobster to order. Cook them to order right here. All okay, the time. Great. So they can get a whole clam bake. Everything? Right here. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, so Joe, we're going to make some boule base, a style of boule base, I suppose you could say. So I thought we would uh, like to have a filet of red snapper. That was a good choice. These are the snappers. They're both red snapper, of course. That looks good. Yes, boneless. Okay. Beautiful filet of fish, nice and firm and sweet taste. It's going to be firm in the stew, yeah. Okay, and a piece of halibut. Another piece of white fish, nice and firm, sweet flavored, mild fish. No bones in this one either. That looks great. And I thought we would add to that some scallops. You have some beautiful looking large scallops. They're beautiful scallops. And those are sized as U10s, they correct? Cook, about 10 to a pound. 10 to a pound. Large. Flavors are the same as small ones, but these are good for grilling also because they don't fall through the grill. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the shrimp, you have some large shrimp. And lots of people do get confused sometimes in the markets about sizes of shrimp. So when these you are sold 2125, because that's how many you get to a pound. 2125. That's okay. With the shell on. Good. They're from the Gulf of Mexico. Beautiful farm. Gulf of Mexico. Fish. And then we'll take some mussels. And where do these mussels these come from? These are called PEI. They come from Prince Edward Island. They're farm raised, they're clean. There's no beards on them, only can use them to pull them off. Right. No dirt inside, they're all nice and clean. They look great. Put them right in your pot. Good. All right. I think that's going to make a nice dish. And uh, I think that's about it for us today. Good. And so, uh, so now, what are your normal operating hours here? We're here every day from Tuesday to Saturday. We open at 10 and close at 6. And on Saturday, we close at 5. Okay. So there's plenty of time we to come in. We take orders in advance. Fish. You can always call us for an order. 
as ready when you get here. Okay. Holiday time, it always helps because we're very, very busy and you're in and out the door much faster. Right. All right. And ask for Joe. You always ask for Joe. All Joe right. is always here. Don't forget. Ask for Joe. So, we're back. I'm back. And we're going to make some seafood. And uh, the first thing we're going to do, again, is add some olive oil to our warm pan. And we're going to uh, saute the fish first, because uh, shrimp, as most of you know, takes a minute to cook. If you're going to cook shrimp on a high heat more than a minute, you know you're overcooking it. Uh, we have some nice mussels. They will steam in the sauce. They will take probably another minute. So we're going to take the halibut and the red snapper and the scallops and saute those first with a pan as just place them in there. When you're cooking any kind of meat in quantity, you want to make sure that you don't smother everything. Keep space around the items that you're cooking. Going to add a little salt. And at this moment, I'm going to add some nice sliced onion. And again, of course, garlic. And we have some nice fresh scapes, garlic scapes. I'm going to put that in. And the tomato basil sauce obviously has basil in it. But I'm just going to add a little extra. And I'm also going to throw in the capers that we utilized earlier in the bruschetta. What we're really creating here is uh, something similar in nature to a boule base, but it's not going to be a soup. It's going to be a main, uh, main dish. And while that's cooking, I just wanted to show you uh, the bulgar wheat that we cooked earlier. And you can see that it's got a nice sheen to it from the oil olive oil that we put in there and uh, has, you can see, the mushrooms and the onions. So this is going to make a nice accompaniment to our uh, seafood dish. Now we have the uh, fish sautéing on one side, so now we're just going to turn each piece over, the scallops and the fish, and you can see that we've got a nice brown texture to this color. And I'm going to add just another touch of olive oil to this so that the fish does not stick to the bottom of the pan. The fish, I would say, is about halfway cooked. And so I'm going to place in the shrimp. I want to make sure that the shrimp, all the material in there, hits the surface of the pan and that it is not left without contact. And uh, then I'm going to also place the mussels in the pan. Now the mussels have been rinsed, they've been cleaned off nicely, so we don't have to worry about any sort of stuff we wouldn't want to eat. And once the shrimp have been in the pan for a few moments, I'm going to just turn them over. You can see that it takes relatively short amount of time. They have been in the pan for 20 seconds, and they, they look like they're halfway cooked already. Turn those over, make sure they hit the surface of the pan. Now. At this moment, we're going to take our freshly made sauce from the jar, 
fresh tomato, basil, and he calls it his pasta sauce. It's a multi-purpose sauce that you can do many, many things with. And we're going to add that to the seafood. Gringo Jacks also makes a pasta sauce, Diablo, a little spicy. I think it would be best not to use that with the seafood so it doesn't overpower the flavor of the seafood. Now we want to turn this up a little bit so that it comes to a nice boil. So we make sure we get everything cooked. All right, now the uh, seafood stew has come to a boil and all the fish is ready to go, cooked just right. And you can see the mussels have opened up nicely. The shrimp is nice and firm, not overcooked, and the fish looks like it's cooked just right. So we're going to now just cook a very quick side dish to add with the seafood. And as Stephen said earlier, we're going to cook some amaranth, which is a nice substitute for spinach. Uh, as I understand earlier this morning, Stephen made an amaranth and goat cheese omelet. Sounds great. So now I'm sa sauteing some onions and place the amaranth into the pan with the olive oil. Very simple procedure here. Takes, again, just a moment. A little touch of salt. And we have some basil left. Why not just add it? A little touch of garlic. So while the amaranth is cooking, we're going to take a moment here now and plate up our meal. We have the bulgar wheat, and it is nice and fluffy, looking very good. And we're going to place our seafood. Next to that, anybody getting hungry yet out there? This needs to go for just a second. And in the tradition of the Bula base, we're going to take a few of these croutons, place it right next to the seafood and you use the croutons to soak up the sauce and then we're going to add the amaranth and voila now we have a meal fit for every man and woman out there so, Gary, when we talked yesterday, I promised there'd be no surprises. Right. I changed my mind. We didn't have a chance to work with Barbara Kamalo this uh, week on getting a wine. But I've got a nice bottle of a Bully Hill goat white wine, and we hope everybody's going to enjoy it here today. Okay. So, let's pour a couple of glasses. Like a toast. Assuming I can get this open. enough for you. So those out there, thank you for watching today. And until next time, keep, keep on, on cooking. cooking. Look out, Mama, it's Danger Man cooking.